Thank you all so much for being here today for Constitution Day. On this day, on um, September the 17th of 1787, 39 people gathered in Constitution Hall or, or in Independence Hall up in Philadelphia to sign off on one of the greatest compromises of U.S. history, the Constitution of the United States. This is so important on so many levels. It impacts us all on a daily basis, even when we don't know that it's impacting us. We as attorneys every day fight for constitutional issues for our clients. And we fight for constitutional issues for victims if we rep are members of the district attorney's office. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to take turns reading portions of the Constitution. Um, everyone is is going to come up and, and just read a portion of that. Um, the Mountain Judicial Circuit Bar Association is hosting this today. And we appreciate the members of the public being here. And we certainly appreciate the members of the press being here as well. Thank you so much for covering this. Before we begin, I thought it was important to to maybe perhaps get a glimpse as to the thought process of, of at least one of our founding fathers, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. And this is what he said about educating the people, especially about the U.S. Constitution. Quote, I know of no safe depositor of the ultimate powers of a society the pe but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discrimination, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform them their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. Judge Caudell is going to start us out. Thank you, Ms. Heisen, and thank you for taking the initiative to put this effort together. I think sometimes too often we, we just take our, our privileges and, and uh, freedoms in this country for granted and, and we forget that we have the responsibilities too and I think one of those responsibilities is recognizing the sacrifices of the past and, and the uh, forethought and foresight of our forefathers in, in preparing this document. So it's my honor to read the uh, preamble. <clears throat> the Constitution of the United States. We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves, to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Section 2. The House of Representatives shall be composed of the members chosen each every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as they shall by law direct. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative until such enumeration shall be made. The state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts eight, Rhode Island and Providence plantations one, Connecticut five, New York six, New Jersey four, Pennsylvania eight, Delaware one, Maryland six, Virginia 10, North Carolina 5, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. When vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. 
The House of Representatives shall choose their Speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. Section 3. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, chosen by the legislature thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Immediately after, they shall be assembled in consequence of the first election. They shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year, of the second class at the expiration of the fourth year, and the third class at the expiration of the sixth year, so that one third may be chosen every second year. And if vacancies happen by resignation or otherwise during the recess of the legislature of any state, the executive thereof shall make temporary appointments until the next meeting of the legislature, which shall then fill such vacancies. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained the age of 30 years and been nine years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. The Vice President of the United States shall be President of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their officers, their other officers, and also a President pro tem in the absence of Vice President or when he shall exercise the office of President of the United States. The Senate shall have the sole power and try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside, and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. Section 4. The times and places and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, that the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meeting shall be on the first Monday in December unless they shall, by law, appoint a different day. Section 5. Each House shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall constitute, constitute a quorum to do business, but a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and su under such penalties as each House may provide. Each House may determine the rules of the proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Each House shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time publish the same, accepting such parts as may be, in their judgment, require secrecy. And the yeas and nays of the members of either House on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. Either House, during the session of Congress, shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two Houses shall be sitting. Section 6. Senators and representatives shall receive a compensation for their services to be ascertained by law and paid out of the Treasury of the United States. They shall in all cases except treason, felony, and breach of the peace be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house they shall not be questioned in any other place. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States which shall have been created, or the emoluments that whereof shall have been in increased during such time, and no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during the continuance in office. I'll keep going if you're not sleeping. Section 7. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. The Senate may propose or concur with the amendments as on other bills. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it becomes law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if, he shall, but if not, he shall return it with his objections to that House in which it shall have originated who shall have the objections at large on their journal and proceed to reconsider it. If after such reconsideration two-thirds of the House of that House shall agree to pass a bill, 
and shall be sent together with the objections to the other house, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered, and if approved by two-thirds of that house, it shall become a law. But in all such cases, the votes of both houses shall be de determined by yeas and nays, and the names of the persons voting for and against the bill shall be entered on the journal of each house respectively. If any bill shall not be returned by the President within ten days, Sundays accepted, after it shall have been presented to him, the same shall be a law, in like manner as if he had signed it, unless the Congress, by their adjournment, prevent its return, and in which case it shall not be a law. Every order, resolution, or vote to which the concurrence of the Senate and House of Representatives may be necessary, except on a question of adjournment, shall be presented to the United States, and shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him, or being approved by him, shall be repassed by two-thirds of the Senate and House of Representatives according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of the bill. Section 8. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. To borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce within foreign nation, with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States to establish post offices and post roads, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, to constitute tribunal, tribu tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the laws of nations, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the apportionment of the, uh, the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may, by secession of particular states and acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government in the United States, and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings, and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested in this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Section 9. The migration or importation of such persons as may as many as the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding ten dollars for each person. The privilege of writ of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. No bill of attainer or ex post facto law shall be passed. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another, nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obligated to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, and by a regular statement of account of the receipts and expenditures for all public money <laughs> shall be published from time to time. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, 
and no person holding any office or profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present emollient office or title or any kind what, whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. Section 10. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts, pass any bill of attainer, ex post facto law, or law impairing, impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. No state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports except what may be absolutely necessary for execution, executing its inspection laws. And the net produce of all duties and imposts laid by any state on imports or exports shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States, and all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of, of tonnage, keep troops, or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit delay. Article 2, Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, and together with the Vice President, chosen for the same term, be elected as follows. Each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors, equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office of trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for two persons, of whom one at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves, and they shall make a list of all the persons voted for and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States, directed to the President of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if there be more than one who have such majority and have an equal number of votes, then the House of Representatives shall immediately choose by ballot one of them for President. And if no person have a majority, then from the five highest on the list, the said House shall in like manner choose the President. But in choosing the President, the votes shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. In every case, after the choice of the President, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the Vice President. But if there should remain two or more who have equal votes, the Senate shall choose from them by ballot uh, the Vice President. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. No person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of President. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. In case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president, and the Congress may, law, may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. The president shall at stated times receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. Before he enter on the ex execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. 
Section 2. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices, and he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provide two-thirds of the senators present concur, and he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law, but the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior offices as they think proper in the President alone in the courts of law or in the heads of departments. The President shall have the power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting co commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. Section 3. He shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the, United, of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in case of disagreements between them with respect to the time of adjournment, he, sh he may adjourn them to such time as he think, shall think proper. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed and shall commission all the officers of the United States. Section 4. The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 3. Section 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made or which shall be made under the authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states and between a state or the citizens thereof and foreign states, citizens, or subjects. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed. But when not committed within, it, within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. Section 3. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have the power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. Article 4, Section 1. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may, by general laws, prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, proceedings shall be provided and the effect thereof. Section 2. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. 
A person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of execution, ex executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service of labor but shall be delivered up on claim of of the proper of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Section 3. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, or nor any nor any state be formed by the uh, junction of two or more states or parts of the states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as that of Congress. The Congress have, have, the, have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory and other property belonging to the United States. And nothing in this Constitution shall be construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or, any, uh, or, or of any particular state. Section 4. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a, rep a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on the application of, this legislat uh, of the legislature or of the executive when the le legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. Article 5. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes, as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which, shall, which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state, without its consent, shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Article 6. All debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Article 7. The ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states, so ratifying the same done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present the 17th day of September in the new year of our Lord 1787 and of the independence of the United States of America the 12th in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names George Washington president and deputy from Virginia John Langdon Nicholas Gilman New Hampshire Nathaniel Gorham Rufus King Massachusetts William Samuel Johnson Roger Sherman Connecticut Alexander Hamilton, New York. William Livingston, David Brearley, William Patterson, and Jonas Dayton, New Jersey. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Mifflin, Robert Morris, George Clymer, Thomas Fitzsimmons, Jared Ingersoll, James Wilson, and Governor Morris, Pennsylvania. George Reed, Gunning Bedford, Jr., John Dickinson, Richard Bassett, and Jacob Broom, Delaware. James McHenry, Dan of St. Thomas, Jennifer, Daniel Carroll, Maryland, John Blair, James Madison, Jr., Virginia, William Blunt, Richard Dobbs, Spate, 
in Hubert Williamson, North Carolina, James Rutledge, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, Charles Pinckney, and Pierce Butler, South Carolina, William Few and Abraham Baldwin, Georgia, attest William Jackson, Secretary. Preamble to the Bill of Rights. Congress of the United States, begun and held at the City of New York on Wednesday the 4th of March, 1789. The conventions of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers, that further declar declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added, and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government, will best ensure the beneficent ends of its institution. Resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled, two-thirds of both houses concurring that the following articles be proposed to the legislatures of several states as amendments to the Constitution of the United States, all or any of which articles, when ratified by three-fourths of the said legislatures, to be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the said Constitution. Articles in addition to an amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America proposed by Congress and ratified by the legislatures of the several states pursuant to the fifth article of the original Constitution. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or pre prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the govern government for a redress of grievances. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Amendment 3. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Amendment 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, in set of cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be tried twice, put in jeopardy or life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any, any criminal case to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Amendment 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by jury shall be otherwise re-examined re in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Amendment 10. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Amendment 11. Judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state 
or by citizens or subject of any foreign state. <clears throat> Amendment 12. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by, about, by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall name in their ballots the persons voted for as president and in distinct ballots the person voted for as vice president, and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president and of all persons voted for as vice president and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate the President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes for President shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if no person shall have such majority, then from the persons having the highest numbers, not exceeding three on the list of those vo voted for as President, the House of Representatives shall choose immediately by ballot the President. But in choosing the president, the vote shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two-thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. And if the House of Representatives shall not choose a president whenever the right of choice shall devolve upon them before the fourth day of March next following, then the vice president shall act as president as in the case of death or other constitutional disability of the president. The person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be the vice president if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed, and if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the vice president. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of two-thirds of the whole number of senators, and a majority of the whole number shall be necessary to a choice. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of president shall be eligible to that of vice president of the United States. Amendment 13, ratified December 6, 1865, Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 14. Ratified July 9, 1868. Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Section 2. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for President and Vice President of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States, or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of the male citizens 21 years of age in such state. Section 3. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress, or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States 
authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services and suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States or any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim for the law, loss, or emancipation of any slave, but all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. Section 5. The Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Amendment 15. Ratified February 3, 1870. Section 1. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2. The Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 16. Ratified February 3rd, 1913. The Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. Amendment 17, passed by Congress May 13, 1912, ratified April 8, 1913. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state elected by the people thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. When vacancies happen in the representation of any state in the Senate, the executive authority of such state shall issue writs of election to fill those such vacancies, provided that the legislature of any state may empower the executive thereof to make temporary appointments until the people fill the vacancies by election as the legislature may direct. This amendment shall not be so construed as to affect the election or term of any senator chosen before it becomes valid as part of the Constitution. Amendment 18, ratified January 16, 1919, repealed by the 21st Amendment, December 5, 1933. Section 1, after one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States, and all territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. Section 2. The Congress and the several states shall have concurrent power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Section 3. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of the several states, as provided in the Constitution, within seven years from the date of the submission hereof to the states by the Congress. Amendment 19. August 18, 1920. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 20, January 23, 1933. The terms of Section 1. The terms of the President and the Vice President shall end at noon on the 20th day of January and the terms of senators and representatives at noon on the third day of January of the years in which such terms would have ended if this article had not been ratified, and the terms of their successors shall then begin. Section 2. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meetings shall begin at noon on the third day of January, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. Section 3. If at the time fixed for the beginning of the term of the President, the President-elect shall have died, the Vice President-elect shall become President. If a president shall not have been chosen before the time fixed for the beginning of his term, or if the vice president-elect shall have failed to qualify, then the vice president-elect shall act as president until a president shall have qualified, and the Congress may by law provide for the case wherein neither a president-elect nor a vice president shall have qualified, declaring who shall then act as president, or the manner in which one who is to act shall be selected and such person shall act accordingly until a president or vice president shall have qualified. Section 4. The Congress may by law provide for the case of the death of any of the persons for whom the House of Representatives may choose a president whenever the right of choice shall have devolved upon them, and for the case of the death of any of the persons from whom the Senate may choose a vice president whenever the right of choice shall have devolved upon them. Section 5. Sections 1 and 2 shall take effect on the 15th day of October following the ratification of this article. 
Section 6, this article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission. Amendment 21, ratified December 5, 1933. Section 1, the 18th article of amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. Section 2, the transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws thereof is hereby prohibited. Section 3, this article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by conventions in the several states as provided in the Constitution within seven years from the date of the submission hereof to the states by the Congress. Amendment 22, ratified February 27th, 1951. Section 1. No person shall be elected to the office of the President more than twice, and no person who has held the office of President or acted as President for more than two years of a term to which some other person was elected President shall be elected to the office of President more than once. But this article shall not apply to any person holding the office of President when this article was proposed by Congress and shall not prevent any person who may be holding the office of president or acting as president during the term within which this article becomes operative from holding the office of president or acting as president during the remainder of such term. Section 2. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission to the states by the Congress. Excuse me. Amendment 23, ratified March 29, 1961. The district constituting the seat of government of the United States shall appoint in such manner as Congress may direct a number of electors of president and vice president equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in Congress to which the district would be entitled if it were a state, but in no event more than the least populous state. They shall be in addition to those appointed by the states, but they shall be considered for the purposes of the election of of president and vice president to be electors appointed by a state, and they shall meet in the district and perform such duties as provided by the 12th article of amendment. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 24, Section 1. Um, amendment 24 passed by Congress August 27, 1962, ratified January 23, 1964. Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president or electors for president or vice president or for senator or representative in Congress shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state by reason of failure to pay poll tax or other tax. Section uh, 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 25, passed by Congress July 6, 1965, ratified February 10, 1967. Note, Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution was modified by the 25th Amendment. Section 1. In case of re the removal of the president from office or a, of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. Section 2. Whenever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress. Section 3. Whenever the president transmits to the president pro temp, pro temp of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives has written declaration that he is unable to discharge his powers and duties of his office, and until he transmits to them a written declaration of the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the Vice President acting as President. Section 4. Whenever the Vice President and a majority of either the, the principal officers of the executive departments or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the President 
is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the Vice President shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as Acting President. Thereafter, when the President transmits to the President pro tem four of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that no inability exists, he shall resume the powers and duties of his office unless the Vice President and majority of either the principal officers of the executive department or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit within four days to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. Thereupon, Congress shall decide the issue, assembling within 48 hours for that purpose, if not in session. If the Congress, within 21 days after receipt of the latter, written declaration, or if Congress is not in session, within 21 days after Congress is required to assemble, determines by two-thirds vote of both houses that the President is unable to, to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the Vice President shall continue to discharge the same as Acting President, otherwise the President shall resume the powers and duties of his office. Amendment 26, passed by Congress March 23, 1971, ratified July 1, 1971. Section 1, the right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of age. Section 2, the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 27, originally proposed September 25, 1789, ratified May 7, 1992. No law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until an election of representatives shall have intervened. That concludes the reading of the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, and all of the amendments. I want to thank each and every one of you so much for being here today. Thank you for, for taking your time out of your busy schedules. Thank you for our elected officials for being here today and for taking your time to read out loud these, these words. Um, magic words is not the right term for it, but it's just, it's a powerful, powerful document that impacts our lives on a daily basis. So thank you once again and, and enjoy the rest of your Constitution Day. Oh, uh, that's easy because this is the greatest country in the face of the earth in spite of all the problems we may be having right now uh, and it's important for us to know why we're the greatest country on the face of the earth and this Constitution is, is the reason why. Uh, we're a country of laws, uh, we're not a country uh, uh, governed by people, we're, we're governed by the laws, the people enforce the laws uh, and it was, it was absolutely an easy thing to do. I'm proud to be in this country, I I'm, I'm thank God every day for it. When uh, Tricia Heiss was talking about it being she couldn't think of the word magic words, I immediately thought of that they were inspired words, uh, not unlike Bible, uh, but in a civil sense. That I got chills uh, in hearing the Bill of Rights uh, being read because we, we live with it every day. As lawyers, as judges, we see a little, little pieces of the Constitution, um, and, but when you hear the entire document read, um, from beginning to end, you realize the, the majesty and the beauty, uh, the elegance of this, of this document and how important it is to the, uh, preserving the way of life that we enjoy in the United States. Well, it's such an important, it's the backbone of the, everything we do here in the judicial system and, uh, and I'm just pleased to be a part of it and actually just excited to hear all the, all the uh, different readers and, and different events as they take place today. Just just hearing the things that I do really on a daily basis as both a lawyer and a judge, um, just hearing those provisions that I repeat so often or that I incorporate um, into arguments that I make or pleadings that I write, um, it, just, it just really had a big impact on me hearing it all together at one time. Well, I mean, this is the fundamental law of our, our land and I think sometimes it's too easy for us to, to lose sight of the importance of the Constitution with all of our modern gadgets that we carry around, cell phones and whatnot. Um, sometimes we forget that it's the words that are written on that paper that 
uh, really um, control and, and uh, provide how we conduct this democracy. And sometimes um, it's too easy to forget that, and we need reminding. And I think at least once a year is not too much, too much to ask, and I hope that this will become an annual event. Oh, uh, well, I haven't read the Constitution through since college, uh, and it was nice to be reminded of some, some of the more arcane things. For instance, I forgot about the last amendment taking 203 years to be ratified. I forgot all about that. That was just interesting information, if nothing else. Because I believe that it's important that everyone recognize the vital uh, nature of the document and the, the importance of the guarantees that it um, provides for us um, because Judge Caudell and I, of course, are it's our responsibility to carry out the um, provisions of the Constitution to guarantee that the citizens that uh, are our constituents uh, enjoy those uh, rights and privileges. Well, yeah, you know, it was it was stirring. Uh, it was it was moving uh, to hear the the thought and the. You know, to hear the words spoken, you can imagine the, um, the work that went into producing just a single sentence, um, knowing the, the democratic process, the back and forth. Uh, you know, it just wasn't something that was handed down by a king. These were elected representatives who gave much thought into not only what was happening in their day, but what was going to happen in the future in this country. So it was, uh, it was stirring. Um, I chose to participate participate today um, because I felt it was very important. Um, I serve as associate juvenile judge for the circuit, um, and what I do in juvenile court um, is greatly impacted by the Constitution. Um, I found it very interesting. I've, I've read the Constitution, studied the Constitution, but I've never at one time sat and listened to the entire Constitution read, and um, it was very it had a very big impact on me.